In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Marianne's guests are leaders in their field, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in their own work. They teach others to develop, refocus, and grow. Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. And remember, make every moment count. Welcome to Moments with Marianne. We're here with a couple very special guests today. We have Dr. Robert Butera. He is the founder of Yoga Life Institute in Pennsylvania, where he trains yoga and meditation teachers and comprehensive yoga therapists. Uh, Dr. Robert has his PhD from California Institute of Integrated Studies, focused on yoga therapy for immunity. He publishes also Yoga Living Magazine. I'm sure all of you have seen this magazine. Dr. Robert has authored many books, including The Pure Heart of Yoga, Meditation for Your Life, and Llewellyn's Complete Book of Mindful Living. You can visit Dr. Robert's website at yogalifeinstitute.com. So let's welcome to the show Dr. Bob. Thank you, Marianne. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure having you here today. Likewise. Uh, I look forward to, to sharing a few thoughts about breathing and some other ideas related to meditation. Well, I understand you are the go-to guy when it comes to breathing, yoga, meditation, all of that. You've been doing that for quite some time. Yes, I guess um, the calendar pages have turned uh, 30 years or so. <laughs> so, it's yes. Time- Time flies when you're having fun, right? <laughs> yes, and um, and I'd love to share a few nuggets. I've had um, the opportunity to give many book lectures over the couple, last couple of years, mm-hmm. and um, that's obviously when the author gets to learn about how they're going to write their next book or what they could have uh, improved upon with all the great questions and feedback. So I wanted to share some of those ideas with you. Oh, definitely, most definitely. I mean, we're, we're all about learning and growing here. You know, let's, would you like to start with that? Because you know I've got some questions for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we would start. You wanted to, to jump off with uh, breath and yoga a little bit? Yes, definitely. You know, And that's one of the questions. I mean, this book is so informative and um, really a, a just the go-to book for mindful living. And I did want to talk to you about, like, how important is breath in our yoga practice? Yeah. Um, I actually have a very brief anecdote and a surprise that happened when I first started teaching in my very first yoga studio. Mm -hmm. We handed out a little, um, what would you call it? My father was constantly on me. you got to get some feedback from your students. Make sure they, they like the classes. So we handed out a little feedback form, and we didn't give multiple choice on what did you like or what, you know, we left it completely open. What did, and really, what did you like in class or what was your benefit? And to my surprise, you know, normally you think a yoga class where you're stretching and doing yoga positions, you're doing relaxation, a little meditation, you would think the stretching would be the obvious number one, right? Mm hmm. And number one, on nine out of ten, and I did this, this is like 300. We did it a second time. We had 300 and some forms was breathing. Mm-hmm. Every single yoga pose that you do, and this is not, you know, this is a kind of a comment that you can make not from, you know, Yoga Studio A on, you know, 4th Street and then the next yoga studio that's a few miles away. Every di- and they're all different. Some are hot, you know. Some are regular temperature. They all focus on breathing, straight across the board. Mm. Well, then that's obviously what people want to learn more about and really care about. That's incorporated in their practice. Definitely. So, so one of the things that we learned as we've you know over the years, um, there is 
you know, something that we won't do on the radio, but you can learn from most any yoga teacher these days how to expand your lungs, make sure you're breathing fully and so forth from a physical side. But what we found when we, when I started to see these results, what people started to share is that at work they take a deep breath. Or in a stressful situation when they're feeling uncomfortable, they noticed their breathing pattern was very different from what the pattern might have been when they were doing the yoga class or meditation, that their their breathing became shallow. And that's one of the things that we know as, uh, in the field of yoga, I guess, we know that the state of mind is reflected in our breathing patterns. Mm-hmm. For example, like every emotion that you have, if you're not like, you know, consciously altering your breathing for some reason and you feel some sort of emotion you can observe your breath and you'll notice that if you're excited you'll oh my gosh all right all right and you can hear my breath change if i'm afraid Mm -hmm. sometimes we hold our breath there's always a pattern so one of the things that's passed down in the yoga scriptures from the ancient yogis is that you can use our kind of psycho-emotional breathing patterns to our benefit if you slow the breath down and give us what would be a centered breath or a stabilizing breath. And that's just typically something that's slow and steady, relatively even on the in length, and that breath will help the nervous system stabilize itself. Now, is that something that can be learned over time, or is it something that can be learned pretty quickly? Well, you can certainly be, um, learn it very quickly. Um, similar to developing any set of muscles, it takes a few months. If you do a, twice a day, once a day, a little breathing exercise, you do a little meditation with it, um, after typically three to six months, your lungs just start to open. It, they literally can be frozen. If you don't use the muscles like any muscles, they become tight. Mm-hmm. So at first, a person starts doing deep breathing. They'll feel something, but if they stick with it over a few months, they'll start to reach their their body's normal maximum. But it can be restricted if you haven't thought of deep breathing. Mm. So I, it, that's something we can definitely work on and with practice get to a point where the, when we're having situations where maybe we're excited or stressed, that we can maintain that center with our breathing. Absolutely. That is fabulous. And, and you know, it's not something, you know, most people would think about if they're not really, if they're maybe starting on their, their journey or, I mean, I've, I've done yoga on and off for many years and, you know, a lot of times I forget to breathe when I'm in poses. <laughs> sure. And then you notice it though. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that that kind of right, and then and that starts to teach you to pay attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's a second there's a second kind of layer to this that I would like to to thread in. Sure. And and this is where you can you can take your yoga. Some people will say there's like external things and then internal things. And a, a different, different writers, different authors have interesting ways of describing this outer world, inner world. Um, so when we start to do yoga, of course, we're immediately going to mimic and learn certain yoga poses. And then as we get further into it, we learn and we mimic the breathing. But as I was saying where there's always an emotion underneath the breath, Mm-hmm. We would start, we could expand that little part of the discussion that I was setting it up for this next point where we focus on our state of mind. And that's what we would start to call our internal yoga. So we can use the breath as kind of an anchor to get us in touch with ourselves and with the way that we're looking at life. And then from that moment of being aware of how we're setting up things in our mind, we can also work on our mind. Mm. Mm, I like that. That is that's definitely a fabulous um, a, fab, a fabulous second part. <laughs> right. So so a lot if of the, times the breathing so itself on, can't. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. 
No, it's okay. I mean, just a lot of times you're so focused, like I've been so focused on the breathing, there's that whole other piece that comes with that, and that's kind of a delicious thing. Right. So there's a couple things you can do. One is being self-aware because the breathing, and we always say that whatever is further within you will be stronger. So a simple breathing exercise, if I'm upset about something, isn't going to just change my being upset or my not accepting something in life. So we can use the breathing as a crutch or an aid, but then ultimately our view of life, our, if you will, our spiritual understanding, our ability to accept things that may not go the way we want them to, um, that's when we start to get in trouble and feel stress. We do then have to work on our own perception and our own way of thinking about life mm-hmm. and and not think I, I don't like to confuse people when I talk about a technique like breathing that it's going to suddenly change everything it can assist you in your own development hmm. well that's that's absolutely fabulous and you know what a great way to start looking at one's practice you know it, it becomes a much deeper thing as opposed to you know, you know, breathing and yoga. You, you'll tend to notice that, and it sounds like it's been your experience too. Like you're doing, you mentioned doing a yoga class, and then you notice, oh, I'm not really breathing in this particular pose, <laughs> and yeah. and and then you could start to study yourself. You know, like mm-hmm. oh, I'm doing this hard pose or something, and how did I react in that? And these are the type of comments that you hear from people when they've been doing their yoga over a long period of time, they start to notice these different parts of themselves. And and that, of course, becomes this continual growth. And I think um, when you take the benefits of yoga, I would love to have given the, that form I told you about where I got the mm-hmm. initial feedback from people. I'd love to be able to give it to them 10 years later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wouldn't that be cool? And, but, and then they would say, that. well, yoga has transformed for me, they'd probably say something. And now I look at it as, you know, a little little more about the way I'm viewing things because that's where we get to later. And and we can extend this point um, to when you're actually meditating, mm-hmm. you can apply the same thing. And that I think... Um, um, I have a book also prior to this one on meditation for your life, which is a be- very much a beginner's meditation book. Mm-hmm. And in that, um, we make the case that there's often a confusion with people trying to meditate where I, I think, again, and when I told you about my book talk, something that I, I helps people a lot to hear is that none of us actually sit down and have zero thoughts in our mind when we meditate. Oh, and that's and a, a lot of times when comforting you start out, for a lot of read, people. What's that? <laughs> that's probably comforting for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, and I, I really want, you know, everybody to feel comfortable and realize that it's not about like, like, um, you know, you're you're a runner and you want to run a, a race. Well, you can kind of measure yourself and you can say, I did it, I didn't do it, or. I got to this level or what have you. Well, with meditation, you can't really measure it for one. And then you start, but you you start to think inside your own mind, I read that you're supposed to not have thoughts. Mm -hmm. Or I read that I'm supposed to only think about my meditation, and I was thinking about the grocery store, and I was thinking about work. And you start to feel somewhat like you're failing at it. And if you were to switch that around... And say, yeah, maybe some saint on a mountaintop didn't have any thoughts. But maybe most of us were able to use meditation as a way of understanding how our thoughts are structured. Hmm. Then it's just a learning experience. And it doesn't, it doesn't need to be this perfection, you know, this aspiration to having this perfect mind of no thoughts. But if I understand the structures of my mind, then I can kind of be free of it. Oh, well, and that's such a, a powerful, um, a powerful place for a lot of us to be in because then we can really look at our practice in a totally different way. Absolutely. So as long as you yeah. sat down, you learn something about yourself. This is what I'll tell people in, in whenever we do a meditation class or 
in one of these talks, if you just learn something about yourself, you've improved. You've definitely, when you do your meditation, all these various health benefits occur. Your blood pressure stabilizes probably. Your nervous system relaxes. You know, your breathing's quieter. You're alert but yet resting, and there's there's probably some unknown yet unresearched benefits to meditation for the brain, you know, that are... They talk about the improvement of our cognitive functioning and such. But I think in time we're going to see those benefits become, um, how would you say it, even more approved uh, in, in terms of scientific terms. But if you just think, um, what am I going to learn today? You can't lose. You can't be a bad. There's no really such thing as a good meditator or a bad meditator. I would say it's the person who learns something is a good meditator. Well, that's, I really appreciate hearing that because there has been a long time for just for me um, during my meditation practice where, you know, they even call it like the monkey mind where my mind's just mm-hmm. going off and it takes me like half my practice to get my mind to calm down. It gets right. easier over time when I've been doing it more consistently, but yeah. it, I still have thoughts to come in and I'm just like, ah, fine. <laughs> <laughs> And, well, you know, and that I would say, like, and and you're being kind because that's that's the experience of most of us. <laughs> and but if you understand what the monkey's doing, that image of the monkey mind, like, what? Mm-hmm. Why is your mind making these images or doing these tricks? And then when you're done your meditation, you can think, oh yeah, maybe I'll look at things differently, or maybe I have to accept this more, or what have you, whatever the thought what that was persistent was there. Um, you know, we we get upset about the color of the dishes, you know what I mean, or the mm-hmm. at the wedding, and, you know, and when what really doesn't really matter, you sit down, you meditate, you know, and you're like, oh, does it matter what color the linen is? Oh, that's okay if it doesn't match. That's not really why we're there anyway, right? <laughs> you know, and, and a normal stressful thought can kind of get in our way. We sit down, we take a new fresh perspective, we see what we're doing, and then we learn something and we can adapt and stay happy. <laughs> hmm. You know, I, I really highly suggest that our listeners check out all of your books, Dr. Bob. You are just a fountain of information when it comes to yoga and mindfulness and meditation and and just the whole gamut and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge with us today on the show well thank you Marianne it's been a pleasure uh, being here thank you again Dr. Bob for being on the show you can visit his website at yogalifeinstitute.com so let's now welcome Erin Byron she is also one of the contributing writers for Llewellyn's complete book of mindful living. So welcome to the show, Erin. Hi, Marianne. I'm so happy to be here today. Thanks for having me. Oh, definitely. I mean, the pleasure is all mine. I mean, this book is definitely the, it's like the mindfulness Bible. <laughs> so, so many great uh, ideas in there. Oh, I, I, it was so many, so many different uh, things to discuss. It is uh, almost mind-boggling. It's like how... How do we even approach this for this um, this session? Because it really has information that will help people in every level of their journey. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the idea because anyone at any age and no matter what's going on in their lives can practice mindfulness. We did our best to offer a whole smattering of ideas and get lots of authors in there to share ways that we can incorporate this helpful practice. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and it, you can definitely tell you've got some great experts that um, have can, you know, lend their voice and and give an information that really is going to help move the mindfulness discussion forward. Now, um, mm. I've got to ask you, and this is, you know, just I'm just curious here, what inspired you to be involved and in, in write this book? There are. So many inspirations, actually, that go along with that book. But Mm -hmm. a few of the highlights for me were just the opportunity to look at very specific areas that mindfulness can be useful in terms of supporting people with their sleep, where so many people in today's society are having a lot of trouble just with that very fundamental health practice of sleeping enough, as well as folks who have chronic 
pain or other health conditions and just plain old training the mind. But then you add into that the the panel of experts who are involved in this, like Jack Canfield and Guy Finley and Cindy Dale and, you know, so many, so many other people who have wonderful things to share about mindfulness and the very idea of what that could do to support the average person in having a better life was truly inspiring to me. Mm, I bet. I bet. I mean, it, the information here is is just amazing, absolutely amazing. So and I just had to, I was just curious about how that all came together for you. <laughs> so we had a... We had a great team on both sides, so there are all those authors contributing their ideas, and then Llewellyn Publishers, of course, who held the vision in the first place. They have mm-hmm. they have a number of complete books of, and this was another for that series. So the team at Llewellyn was really great in finding the people and supporting the project and having that terrific balance that you already mentioned. Oh. Well, and you can tell in how the book flows and, um, you know, the the different chapters that are listed with the authors that, again, lent their voice. It, it It's a pretty powerful book. So I suggest all of our readers go out immediately and pick up their own copy. And it really, um, it's it's definitely putting this, you know, putting your intentions and putting yourself in the right direction as far as the mindfulness discussions concerned. Now, mm. one of the questions that I have here for you is, what is the effect of mindfulness on our overall state of mind? That's um, a really interesting thing happens, actually, from mindfulness. So mindfulness itself, the way I'm defining it when I talk about it today, the way it's often thought of is a sense of presence, this quality of just noticing what's happening in my world right now. Mm-hmm. How does the air feel on my skin? How is my breath? What are the thoughts that are with me? And simply by noticing right now, a whole batch of our stress falls away because so much of what we worry about in life hasn't happened yet. It's is an imagining that things are going to go terribly wrong, and they often simply don't. Mm -hmm. And even when they do go wrong, we handle them better than we think we're going to when we're simply fretting. So mindfulness has the effect of keeping us present in what is in this moment, and in this moment, things are pretty good. Almost always, right now, is a nice little moment in time. A further effect of that is that from noticing moment after moment that this is a pretty good life, the anatomical brain itself actually changes size and shape so that it gets better at better, get better and better at seeing happiness in everyday life, better at perceiving what it is to feel good, where there's a joke to be had, where there's a person to connect to or a kindness to be shared. I think that's really powerful in changing not just our own emotional lives, but changing the world itself through those acts of presence and kindness. And that's that's just a perfect place to be in. That's really the kind of like the sweet spot in life where you know you're really present to what's going on and fully aware of all the gifts that are showing up. Because you know life can be so beautiful when we're present. So true, so true, and and the beauties in the simplicity. I'm uh, I'm in northern Ontario right now, and all around me I can hear birds and crickets, and looking at treetops and funny little patterns in the clouds, and and those simple beauties reflect to us how how well things really can be. Mm-hmm. Do you know that kind of reminds me of. Um, a few months back, I'm in Colorado, and we have, you know, very adverse weather. So one day it's nice and sunny, and the next day we've got, like, a lot of snow. And <laughs> on one of those a lot of snow days, <laughs> I took my dog for a little walk and took a little video and sent it to a friend of mine and said, hey, you know, check out this snow. It's quite a bit. And, you know, it was interesting. She pointed out, she's like, wow, 
with all that snow falling, you could still hear the birds in the background. They're just having a party. And it, I was mm. so focused on trudging that I didn't notice the birds chirping. <laughs> it's, well. like, it's kind of like, you know, you know, and it kind of brings back to the mindfulness part. It's like, you know, are you trudging through our lives? Or are we really enjoying, regardless if it's snow or not snow or what's going on, you know, the the beauty that's around us. So now, you know, and it kind of brings me to my next question here. You know, so how does mindfulness help people that have stress and anxiety? What science is starting to show more and more, actually, is that mindfulness is an incredibly powerful tool for stress and anxiety. Um, in terms of changing the shape of the brain and the way we actually rehearse stress in our lives by looking for things that might go wrong, in a way that's prudent, right? I need to think ahead. There's the whole look before you leak thing. But if that becomes a pattern, if that's the way I'm experiencing every moment, like you walking your dog, if you're thinking, hope I don't slip off the mountain, hope this <laughs> snow doesn't create an avalanche, I hope my dog's paws don't freeze, then that's that's everything you're going to notice. But if instead the thought is, listen to my crunching boots in the snow, and isn't that cool the way it sparkles? And if I stop here for a minute over the sound of my footfalls, I can actually hear the bird calls. The, that is a completely different way of activating the brain. So from a neuroscience perspective, mindfulness can help us with stress and anxiety. But it goes even deeper than that. Um, we, My co-author on this mindfulness book also wrote a yoga therapy for stress and anxiety book with me. And in that book, we talked a lot about how beliefs cause stress. So when we're being mindful, we notice the belief systems that underlie those stress habits and the anxiety in the first place. So through mindfulness, we get to see, oh, I have this pattern of making sure nothing's going to go wrong, or Mm -hmm. I expect people to be mean to me when really they might actually like me and we could be friends. Whatever the underlying belief is, through a practice of just being mindful of the kinds of thoughts we think, we have the chance to also get curious about those thoughts and decide, is this how I want to be thinking about this? How true is that thought really? And over time, we can actually deconstruct the belief patterns that cause stress and anxiety. Gosh, we could spend all day talking about this book and um, and the mindfulness. And I don't want to give it away. I, I really do want our listeners to go out and pick up this book and Go to your website and be part of the community. Do counseling sessions or over-the-phone sessions at all? Yes, I do counseling and yoga therapy sessions through Skype. So I have clients and um, yoga therapists that I mentor across the U.S. and Canada. Oh, my gosh, that's a thing. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Who knew you could do yoga over Skype? I love that. I'm going to have to give that a shot and give that a try. So we can go ahead yeah. and book that with you. I want to thank you for taking this time being with us here today, Erin. I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, it was my pleasure, Mary, and such a terrific chat. Thanks for sharing <laughs> ideas with me. Thanks for having me on your show. Thank you. We've been talking with Erin Byron. You can visit her website at erinbyron.com like to thank you for tuning in. We are going to be right back after these messages. Our next guest coming right up is Ember Grant. She is the authority on crystals. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. Discuss.
discover the book publisher's weekly calls compelling. Piper, once and again, is the breathtaking debut novel by psychic medium Caroline E. Zani. Death has no power over love. Piper, once and again, is a story of hope for the hopeless and faith amidst tragedy. Follow Piper on a journey of loss and redemption as she tries to find the one man who can help her figure out why she must be. Piper, once and again, www.carolinezani.com. Are you a successful entrepreneur or sales professional, but you're ready to take your success to the next level? I'm Bob Berg, and I invite you to join me at our next Go-Giver Sales Academy. You'll learn how to communicate your exceptional value to more people, sell at full price, become objection-proof, and embrace the abundance that's your birthright. Limited to just 12 people, so it's personalized, impactful, and transformational. Visit GoGiverSalesAcademy.com and see what others are saying. This is Tanya Carol Richardson, author of the new book, Angel Insights. I used my psychic gifts to get messages from the angels to write this book, and I'd like to help you get personalized messages from your own angels. Learn your subconscious blocks, make sense of the past and present, and receive advice about navigating your future in an angel reading at tanyablessings.com. Book a session with me and your angels at tanyablessings.com. During times of uncertainty, challenges, and change, how do we find a ray of hope to move forward? In Amy Van Atta Slater's best-selling book, Moments, Magic, Miracles, and Martinis, she offers a torch of inspiration, motivation, mindfulness, and authenticity that illuminates even the most desperate of situations with possibility. Order your copy today to see what the buzz is all about at www.amyvslater.com. Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm here with a very special guest, Ember Grant, and she's here to discuss her book, The Second Book of Crystal Spells. So welcome to the show, Ember. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, this is pretty fascinating. I don't know a whole lot about it, so we're going to be asking you a lot of questions here. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So why don't we start from the beginning? What inspired you to write this book? Well, I've been working with gemstones and crystals on a metaphysical level for a really long time. As a practitioner of Wicca, it's kind of central to, you know, connecting with nature and and a lot of the things we do. And so um, I started writing about, you know, all of these kinds of metaphysical New Age topics um, back in about 2003. And um, a good friend of mine suggested that, since I'm so into crystals, that I should write about crystals. And my previous book was a book on candle magic. Um, but I wrote my first book, The Book of Crystal Spells, uh, came out back in 2011. And so that kind of started it. Obviously, that was the first book. It preceded the second book of Crystal Spells. I wrote a second one because there was just so much that I wanted to discuss. It wouldn't all fit in one book. Plus, since I wrote the first one, there was quite a bit of interest and people wanting to know more. So I just wrote a sequel. Oh, and, and, you know, it's actually perfect. And I think a lot of times people get a little confused when they think of Wiccan, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times it, it may have a bad connotation, but it really is a strong connection to, mm-hmm. you know, nature and earth and and mm-hmm. really kind of, it's, at least, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of where I see it. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is central. It's considered to be an, an earth-based, spiritual path, uh, we uh, don't want to say worship, that's probably too strong of a word, but some people use that word, but we really strive to connect with um, the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water as the basis for all life and uh, have a deep respect and reverence for nature. Um, none of us do it the same way. There are so many different kinds of Wicca, and some people mm-hmm. would just would rather say they're witches or maybe just pagans that's you know, in that group as well. Um, so we all kind of do a, l- a little bit of different things, but at the core, we're all about um, respect for nature and connecting with nature and celebrating the seasons and all of those sorts of things. But most of us do a little dabbling in modern magic. So mm-hmm. that's kind of where the work with crystals comes in, although a lot of people um, collect them and like to work with them for things like healing, too, which is 
not the same thing as crystal magic. They're connected, but they're not the same. Well, and um, what's interesting, what I've learned from just the the whole, you know, like the magic part and then what's, what most people are doing today, either with crystals or um, with intention, it feels like it's a lot of intention base. Mm-hmm. So, exactly. So who couldn't use more magic then, you know? <laughs> exactly. That's what a, a lot of people, I think, get um, caught up in the idea of magic and something that they need to perform or that they need to do. And there certainly is there, there's ceremonial magic, which is a little bit different than this. But uh, basically, crystals are like any kind of tools uh, for your intent. It's something to help you focus your energy. A lot of people like to use them for meditation, um, People like to wear them. There's, as I mentioned, the, the idea of crystal healing. Some people like to place them in different parts of their body uh, to help with, um, again, relaxation or other kinds of ailments. I don't do a lot of that. I use them as, again, more of like a, a spiritual tool for focusing intent. Oh, okay. And that and that sounds just kind of right along the line of what a lot of people are using nowadays. It's just called something different, you know. It's like, oh, yeah, we're absolutely. using our intention. It's pretty mm-hmm. much the same same kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. um, why don't you um walk us through like a if we're going to do a um kind of a crystal spell Maybe, mm-hmm. and it could be for anything, you know, I'll let you choose whatever you think would be kind of nice oh, sure. to show here. But if we're doing something that's just going to kind of elevate us throughout the day, what would be mm-hmm. a, a good one to choose? Sure. Well, uh, I'm going to look at the first book right now um, because in that book there is a section, um, the way I've divided it into chapters, um, mm-hmm. they're by style of spell. And some people prefer, uh, instead of spell, they prefer the word um, affirmation or meditation. Sometimes the words are used interchangeably, although they're not exactly mm-hmm. the same thing. They can be. Okay. And so I have a section in the book called Rituals, Meditations, and Affirmations. And in that chapter, there are all different kinds of spells um, and dedications. For example, you could make something like a, a piece of jewelry or a sun catcher, and you could dedicate it for a purpose uh, mm-hmm. so that every time you see it, you have that positive association with it. So that's one way. Um, there are also rituals for opening your third eye. There are relaxation rituals, dream spells. Um, so we can look at one of those if you like. Oh, that would be perfect. Okay. So um, I just happened to um, open it up to something called an onyx meditation for balance. And so in the book, what I start off with in most cases is a brief explanation of the kind of stone um, mm-hmm. because I think it's important when working with crystals that practitioners understand a little bit about the scientific qualities and properties of the stone and so I always have like a brief explanation of you know what kind of stone it is and what their you know um, scientific properties are and so I start Mm -hmm. off explaining what onyx is and then it's this is very brief this meditation um, just asks the uh, user to get a piece of real onyx any kind sometimes people like to use jewelry Other people like, you know, tumbled stones that they can hold on to and carry or put in their pocket. And for this meditation, um, one would hold the stone and visualize or focus or try to get in a state of mind for achieving balance. Mm -hmm. And holding the stone while focusing on it, and then I always include some kind of a chant with the intent being um, while you hold the stone and chant the words, it kind of brings your intent into the real world. Uh, again, a lot oh. of this is, you know, takes place in, in your mind. It's all about intent. And the chant for this one goes like this. Stone of earth against my skin, balance energy within, yin and yang, dark and light. Let the opposites unite. So I'm oh, very fond of I'm very fond of doing very simple things like that because, again, it's all about intent. And it can sound uh, deceptively simple, but mm-hmm. if you're really focused and you really uh, commit yourself to it, it's very effective. And some of them are a little more complicated. Some of these spells involve lighting various candles, combining them with uh, plants, herbs, and flowers. Some involve creating grids out of sand or salt, um, drawing different designs and patterns. So it can be as simple as holding a stone and chanting and visualizing all the way up to elaborate altar layouts. There's all kinds Hmm. of things you can do. 
Well, and, you know, your book is so, it's got so much information because I can see where it does have the, you know, it talks about the stone, it talks about the chant, and when you walked through that, it kind of brings it all together Mm -hmm. as far as, you know, with the affirmation or the magic that we are wishing to bring into our lives. Mm -hmm. And visualization is key. And we see, like, if you can see it happening and whatever that means to you, that's what really makes it your own and makes it really personal. And that's probably the most important part is the ability to put that intent into, you know, your mind and visualize it and see your results actually happening. Now, um, in the second book of Crystal Spells, Mm -hmm. so you use crystals and minerals and even Mm -hmm. salt. Um, mm-hmm. And then you have another book that you use, candles. Do you combine them? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, one um, can, well, you can do so many different combinations. You don't have mm-hmm. to. I have met a lot of people who are strictly into using candles for magic. Um, but most people I know uh, combine all different things. We combine candles and crystals and, again, adding other things into, like plants, um, herbs, incense. Mm -hmm. all kinds of different things. But candles and crystals, in my opinion, go really well together, and I love making decorative layouts um, on my altar with uh, a variety of different candles and stones that complement the candles. Sometimes I kind of arrange them together um, in a circle, sometimes just big piles or bowls full of stones with candles around it. There's so many endless combinations. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting because, you know, I – I have my own little altar area where I have a Buddha statue and I've got, you know, different stones mm-hmm. and crystals mm-hmm. and candles and all this stuff. So I'm looking at this going, well, I'm not just about prepared. <laughs> you know? Yeah, definitely. I find that's one reason I wrote the book is that a lot of people, they buy the stones, they see them in the store, they pick them up and they're, they're drawn to them because, yes, they're mm-hmm. pretty and they're interesting, but they set them on their altar or on a shelf and that's, the end of it they just look at them and or they hold them occasionally but some people have said well i have this stone now what do i do with it how can i get more out of it and so that's why i tried to come up with all of these different techniques and of course you can personalize them and make them your own you don't have to do the chance you can just you know do um you know again a variation of them but i think that that's helpful for people who are attracted to a, a crystal they like it they want it but they're not sure what to do with it once they get it home <laughs> I would be one of those people. <laughs> I pick up ones. I'm like, oh, that's pretty. I have to have it. And then mm-hmm. I get it. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, it's going to sit on this shelf or yeah, and it's like, on okay, this what altar. Does it do? What does it mean? <laughs> yeah. And your book really does outline, you know, like, you know, the different stones. It has quite an index here. My goodness. And then it gives the resources. It's like, okay, well, now I've got my stone. What am I going to do with it? Mm-hmm. One that I've been kind of drawn to here that you have in your book is Gypsum Rose uh, Motivational Spell. And so I really oh, like mm-hmm. that because it gives people the opportunity to kind of visualize, um, you know, getting, just being successful. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I love spells like that. I think a lot of people find the need for that in their lives, and because we all define success in different ways, that leaves these kinds of spells wide open for anyone to personalize and say, okay, my idea of success is this, whether it's a specific job someone wants or they want to, um, you know, just make progress on a project or mm-hmm. anything. Um, you can visualize your need and choose a, a stone that has that kind of personality, for lack of a better word, and so... Anyone can just flip through here and find something that that is useful, I think. I hope. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. So you do not have to be Wiccan to buy this book. It actually Not at all. No. No, all. this is for for everybody that, you know, if you buy a gemstone or a stone and uh, want to do some, you know, manifesting or some, you know, just some visualization projects, this is perfect. And, oh, my goodness, so now the next thing I'm going to ask you here that's caught my eye is point grids. So Mm -hmm. what are point grids and how can we benefit by using them? Sure. Well, I I included that this time, and I included um, grids in the first book, too, because Mm -hmm. crystal points, those classic clear quartz crystal points, are one of the, I think, most popular stones that people who are drawn to this kind of work always um, they go for first. It's like, oh, I have Uh to get a clear quartz point. And they are. There's like this universal, almost, you know, sort of magical crystal that people 
always want to have on their altar. And in making a grid, it's a way that you can take your visualization and your intent um, to another level, maybe make it a little more complicated. Uh, we try to complement our, our visualization and our intent with a layout that um, sort of represents what we want to have happen. So like shapes like squares or for stability, and we can use those for prosperity, and we can use other different kinds of shapes um, to imagine energy flow moving in a certain way. So it, it really just helps with visualization. So oh. in the first book, the the grids in that one are um, – they're, they're grids that are made using – all kinds of different stones, tumbled stones, crystal points, clusters, all different shapes. And the grids make designs like spirals and triangles and different things. In the second book, I focus solely on the little quartz points and how you can arrange those points uh, for very specific goals. Again, so you can visualize your energy. For example, the pinnacle grid. Um, and it visualizes or you visualize as you build the grid something coming to fruition, for example. Mm -hmm. And it also takes numerology into account. The numbers mean things, too, so you're using a certain number that has significance. And you can also add in different kinds of quartz points, such as amethyst or smoky quartz, um, to give it another sort of flavor, kind of like using spices when cooking. Mm, that's perfect. My goodness, I, I never knew it had such a great, <laughs> such a diverse use. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do so many. You can build any kind of design you want. And, of course, you know, you don't have to stick to these designs. If someone wants to build a crystal grid, just get the stones out and start playing and see what happens. Again, you can do spirals, sun shapes, stars, squares, pyramids. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind that the shapes usually have some kind of symbolic importance. Again, you know, um, a spiral would be like a continuation. Um, a lot of people use spirals to represent, you know, the life force and continuation of, of things. And, again, squares are used for stability, sometimes mm -hmm. prosperity. And there are also different kinds of shapes, too. I have some in here that are stars. I have uh, figure eights and one called the feather. And some of these I just, you know, came up with while I was playing with my crystal. <laughs> and that's what I call it play. It is, it's play. They're like toys it, in a way. Well, do you know it? And but it makes it, and that's, that's where the magic is, right? <laughs> yeah, you've got to get to know them. You have to kind of get in the zone, take them outside in the sunlight, look at the sparkle, you know, get to know them. It might sound corny, but I think if you're going to use them as a spiritual tool uh, and you're going to use them to focus your intent, you want to kind of make it personal and, and really, you know, just, yeah, get, get to know them and look at them and appreciate them. Mm -hmm. And each one has a different quality. Yeah, so definitely. You'll, mm -hmm. you'll bring different things um, mm -hmm. either into your life or um, it helps set different intentions. Yes. Now, and in the first book, I, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. In the first book, there's uh, a section on dedicating and, and, well, cleansing and charging and dedicating stones because some people um, – want to make sure that before they get started that they have um, that kind of a foundation. And not mm -hmm. that you can't just jump in with the second book and get started. You, of course you can. But um, those techniques are also good because sometimes when we are trying to focus our intent, um, if we've gone through that motion of, you know, finding a stone, cleansing it symbolically, washing away any baggage it might have, uh, and then dedicating it for our purpose before we use it in a spell – that's just one more step to make the intent even stronger. So I always recommend doing that step because I think it makes it more meaningful. Okay, so we're going to ask you next about, the, like we, like I have a mouse in my pocket, I'm going to ask you next <laughs> about the whole cleansing of the stone. So mm -hmm. I went and let's say I, I picked up a stone at, you know, a, a local event or shop and brought it home. So what do I, what's, what's one of the ways that I can cleanse my stone? A really simple way, and this is what I usually do, is I take the stone and I, I put it on a bed of salt crystals. Mm. I have a dish of sea uh -huh. salt that I keep on my altar. And I usually let the stone sit on the sea salt um, for a couple of days. Um, it's kind of nice to do it on a waning moon because that mm -hmm. signifies, you know, um, you know getting rid of any kind of unwanted energy that might be lingering on it. It's kind of a good time for cleansing things. But you can also um, cleanse them with water. 
Mm-hmm. Especially if the stone um, has some dust on it or it's been somewhere that's been handled by a lot of other people. Some people like that actual physical act of cleaning. And so you can put them uh, simply in your sink um, and, and just rinse them with water. If they really are dirty, like if you find a rock and you want to clean it up, you can you can use liquid hand soap, toothpaste. <laughs> An old toothbrush is great mm-hmm. for scrubbing a, a cluster um, anything that you want to do that way is, is also perfectly fine. The intent, again, is the important part where you're visualizing anything that um, might have – the crystal might have been used for previously or anyone who previously owned it or anything like that. You can just visualize all that stuff just being taken away, and it's fresh and it's new, uh, like a, a blank canvas for you to use. Oh, that's perfect. So it doesn't have to be this long, drawn-out thing. It doesn't have to be. And you can make it as elaborate as you'd like. And some people do a cleansing where they do, um, you know, the salt and the uh, the water. You know, cleanse it with water first and put it on the salt. And some people, you know, do um, smudging with sage. That's one way you can do it. There's so many things. You can leave them sit out in the sunlight or the moonlight. Usually, though, that's kind of like a charging method where you're trying to get the stone to sort of soak up energy. So... But still, that it could be used as well. There are lots of varieties of, of ways to cleanse. Okay, but I recommend yeah. water and salt. <laughs> that sounds, yeah, that sounds like it's the easy. easiest. You know, I, I got my stone today. Let's clean that puppy up and, right. and start getting. So now let's say I want to charge it. So mm-hmm. we can do it with, to charge it with good energy. So mm-hmm. you talked about like sunlight, moonlight. We can use that, either right. one of those. Okay. Absolutely. And some stones, um, again, depending on what kind of element they are associated with, uh, would be uh, more receptive to certain things. Like if you have a piece of pyrite, it's associated with you know, fire and the sun and all those bright, shiny things, you might want to put that out in the sun so it can soak that up that energy. Where if you had a piece of moonstone, moon being in the name, you might want to set that out under the light of a full moon to, to give it a little boost. Of course, if you're charging it for a specific spell, you might want to go through an extra step to really make sure that when you're doing your charging, you're thinking about what you're going to use it for. So that's Mm -hmm. the difference. You can do just a general kind of, hey, let's give it a boost of energy, or I'm going to use this stone to fill in the blank. (laughs) Help me get a job. Help me find love. And then you think Mm -hmm. about that while you're charging it. And repeated use of, of a stone for the same thing over and over is what I call dedicating. So if you have, and I like to use it with jewelry especially, if you have a special ring that you always want to wear when you're doing something and you want it to help you, say, public speaking, for example, dedicate Mm -hmm. it for that. You know, uh, use it for that purpose over and over and over again. And then it just becomes kind of symbolic to you of associating that object with success in what you're doing. And it's kind of like Dumbo's feather, right? (laughs) You know, (laughs) it's magic. And, you know, before you know it, uh, you know, you're on your own. And, it is. They are ultimately a tool. They help us with, with our, mm-hmm. our personal goals. Well, hey, baseball players do it with socks. Why can't we do Absolutely. it with them? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not really much different. <laughs> well, it's you describe that better. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it really, I mean, I, I really appreciate this because it is a very – private practice it sounds like that mm-hmm. you can just cultivate on your own and it it can uh, really help you on your journey mm-hmm. and you can of course do that you can have groups uh, you can get people together and do group rituals with crystals you can bring them out into your home i have them all over my house and in just about every room i think i do have them in every room <laughs> i have them outside they're in my potted plants they're in my garden mm-hmm. um you know so they can be decorative and magical um symbolic all at the same time and they just they're so joyful. They're just so wonderful to have around. Oh, well, and um, so I know people can reach you at your website. Why don't you share with our listeners where they can find you at? Of course. Um, embergrant.com is my website, and at the bottom of the homepage, there's a link to find me on Facebook. Oh, and okay. I have several Facebook pages. I have uh, an Ember Grant page just for me as an author. And I welcome anyone to message me or leave me a note right on the wall. Um, but I also have a special page dedicated to each of my books. I have a Facebook page for the Book of Crystal Spells, which includes both books. And I have a book for magical candle crafting. And I show pictures there of minerals and stones and crystals. I have some printable grids uh, from the first book. If people would like to you know, print 
a diagram that they can lay stones on instead of having to draw it. I have some of those on there as well. Um, and I welcome anyone to contact me with questions or just to talk about your experience with using crystals and magic. It's just really neat to hear what other people are doing and it's fun to share. Oh, definitely. And um, I know that um, you, know, you have some coaching on the horizon. So if someone would mm-hmm. like to have some coaching sessions in regards yes. to setting up their practice and, and mm-hmm. just guidance and help with that, that's definitely something you can do. My goodness, you're such a wealth of information with all this, you know. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and I'd be happy to help anyone figure out their personal power stone, for example. Of course, they can read about how to do that in, in the books. But uh, once you have that, you might have some questions about what to do. I'm always happy to, to you know, give some advice. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Please contact me and find me on Facebook. Okay. Well, we have a couple minutes, so I think we're going to circle the wagons back around to the Power Stone. That actually sounds kind of fun. Okay. <laughs> well, why, don't, sure. why don't you share a little bit of that with us for sure? Okay. Absolutely. Well, I like to think of, um, you know, Stones is having a kind of a personality, and they have come to have associations with certain things over the years from you know, from folklore and based on their colors and, and so on. And a lot of sources out there, a lot of, you know, like your crystal and stone encyclopedias, will give you lists of astrological signs, um, different stones that are associated with signs, sun signs, moon signs, and, and all those all those things. You can, you can pick stones that associate with or correspond with all of your different signs if you have your natal chart done. Mm -hmm. But I also like to stress to people that if you're drawn to a particular stone over and over again, you keep collecting it even though you have one already, that might be a sign that that's a stone that has some special meaning for you, something that uh, maybe you need to learn or explore in more depth. And so Mm -hmm. I always encourage people that if that's happening, if you keep either encountering a stone over and over again or you keep being drawn to them, that you research its properties and see um, what it, what about that stone kind of matches with your life. And then you can find ways to use that. And again, you can use your sign. Um, you can use your birth date. You can uh, reduce that number using numerology and find um, corresponding stones for that as well. All different kinds of ways that you can experiment with finding your stones. And, you know, it could be a birth stone. It could be that simple. Um, but you can have more than one what I call Ooh. personal power stones. Oh, that's perfect. And so it's really something that's very personalized. Um, do you do natal charts or have them get a natal chart done first? I would say they... have one done. I'm not an expert in astrology, so um, you can have those done online. I think there are websites that you can have I'll have that done for free. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, as a very basic one. Of course, if you just know your sun sign and your moon sign, even your rising sign, knowing those things would be helpful. And then you can just explore from there. Just look through uh, the books and see uh, what stones are listed as corresponding with your sign and see if any of them speak to you. Hmm. And if they don't, um, maybe you can check them out and see if you might find something new. Well, or they can make an appointment with you and get it all figured out. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah, I'd be happy to help. I don't have a formal service yet, but I, I am thinking about starting a, a formal consulting service. So stay tuned. If that happens, it will be uh, announced on my website. Oh, definitely. And that, that would be very interesting, I'm sure, to many people to be able to really connect with that in a deeper way, especially since you're such a fount of, of information here. I mean, my goodness, this book I was looking at going, wow. I'm like, where do you start? <laughs> <You know? laughs> it seems it's like fabulous. there's a lot, but it's it's easy and fun. And I, I think, oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It definitely is. It definitely is very easy. It's very fun. There's just great information in here, and I just feel like a kid in the candy store with it. So, <laughs> well, you, thank you. I do love my rhyming chants. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Amber, thank you, you so much for them, but... <laughs> taking the time to be on oh, the show with us here today. Thank you. I've enjoyed it so much. Yeah, definitely. And for all of our listeners out there, I'd like to thank you for tuning in today. You can visit Amber Grant's website at embergrant.com and definitely uh, go visit her Facebook page and get connected with her. And uh, again, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in today. And remember, make every moment count.
Join us next time for Moments with Marianne, when host Marianne Pestana brings another inspirational, gifted leader to help us grow. Tune in every second Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for Moments with Marianne, when the Dream Vision 7 Radio Network is at 1510 a.m. Boston. Or catch Moments with Marianne every Thursday and Friday at 5 p.m. and 5 a.m. Eastern Time by going to dreamvision7radio.com. To learn how Marianne started her business from the ground up, visit mariannepestana.com. Don't miss this. And remember, make every moment count.